It was the fall of 1962 when I began my residency at the secluded St. Agnes Hospital in northern Maine. I was a bright-eyed young doctor, freshly graduated from medical school and eager to start my career. At the time, I could never have imagined the terrifying events that would unfold during my time at that remote hospital compound. St. Agnes was a gothic and imposing structure with high brick walls and narrow windows. It was deep in the dense northern Maine forests, at least 10 miles from the nearest town. This isolated location should have been my first warning sign, but I was too excited and naive to notice anything wrong. When I arrived, the hospital's director, Dr. Heidel, greeted me warmly. He informed me that I would be provided on-site accommodation and would work overnight shifts monitoring patients. This seemed a bit unusual, but Dr. Heidel assured me it was necessary for administering certain treatments. I accepted his explanations without question. My first weeks at St. Agnes were relatively uneventful. I made rounds, monitored patients overnight, and caught up on paperwork. The days blended together in a monotonous routine. The only peculiar thing was the restricted access east wing, which was kept permanently locked. When I asked about it, Dr. Heidel said it was reserved for delicate procedures requiring isolation. At the time, I thought little of it. However, that all changed one night during my midnight shift. It was a cold November night. I had just finished my nightly rounds, checking vital signs and updating charts. As I walked down the empty hall heading back to my office, a low moan drifted through the silence. I paused glancing around. But the long corridor was still and quiet once more. Figuring it was just noises drifting in from outside, I continued on my way. The remote hospital often picked up odd sounds floating on the night wind. Settling back into my office, I sipped a late-night coffee and caught up on paperwork. The distant cries crossed my mind again, but I shrugged it off. On windy nights, the old building made all kinds of creaks and groans. It was nothing to concern myself with. I worked on patient files until the sun peeked over the horizon, then wearily made my way to the on-call room to catch a nap before my next shift. The following day was like any other at St. Agnes. I arrived mid-morning to begin my rounds of the elderly, long-term patients on my wing. Mrs. Delacour complained of back pain, which I treated with an anti-inflammatory and massage. Mr. Garrison's bed sores needed redressing. Miss Clark needed help eating after her stroke paralyzed one arm. Routine, mundane cases, but necessary work all the same. After rounds, I updated charts in my cramped office while nibbling on a ham sandwich from the cafeteria. Only three more hours until I was off for the night. Just as I was thinking of turning in early, Nurse Kaplan stopped by about Mr. Garrison's medication refill. I promised to take care of it before I left. The day passed quickly, and I soon found myself once again making the chilly walk across the campus back to my room. The next night, the cries returned. I was updating Mrs. Delacourt's chart when that same low moan drifted down the hallway. This time it seemed louder, more distinct. I set my pen down and went to investigate, but the cries faded before I could locate the source. Shivering, I returned to my paperwork unable to concentrate as I strained to hear any further noises. But the rest of the night passed without incident. The following week was more of the same. During the day, I tended to patients, catching naps between shifts. At night, I heard the occasional odd cry, but could find no cause. I considered asking Dr. Heidel about it, but hesitated to admit I had been wandering the halls at night. One evening over dinner, I casually mentioned the noises to Nurse Kaplan. She stiffened briefly but then brushed it off as old building sounds. Her cursory response left me unsatisfied. Soon, I could think of little else besides the source of the cries. I found myself wandering past a certain hallway each night, lingering outside the forbidden east wing. I would press my ear to the cold metal door but hear nothing besides the thud of my own heartbeat. After a few weeks, the cries stopped completely, leaving only tense silence. But the mystery continued to plague my thoughts. 
On a quiet Saturday evening, I was catching up on paperwork when I decided to take another walk past the East Wing. As I approached, I noticed a keypad security panel mounted by the door, which I had never seen used. Someone really did not want anyone getting inside. I leaned close to examine the numbered buttons. A keycard lock blinked red above it. Suddenly, the possibility of gaining entry seemed real. But did I dare try? I continued my wanderings, internally debating the risks. My moral curiosity battled my sense of self-preservation. The hospital administrators clearly wished to keep some secrets. Yet my oath as a doctor compelled me to investigate anything that could be harming a patient. In the end, it was the echoes of those pitiful cries that made my decision. Some unknown soul was suffering behind that door, and I had to help if I could. Now I needed a way in. A neglected keycard would be my best bet. I knew Dr. Heidel usually worked late on Thursdays. That night I lingered outside his office until I saw the lights go out around midnight. I waited another twenty minutes to be safe. Then I crept inside, holding my breath. There, on his desk, lay his keycard next to a cold cup of coffee. My heart pounding, I grabbed the card and slipped back outside unseen. Approaching the east wing door, I hesitated only a moment before swiping the card. A light blinked green, and I heard the lock disengage. This was my chance. Taking a deep breath, I pulled open the heavy door and stepped inside the forbidden wing, clicking on my pocket flashlight. A long concrete corridor stretched out before me, lined with rusty piping and decaying plaster. I walked slowly, listening for any sounds. But nothing broke the silence except my cautious footsteps and racing pulse. Up ahead, I spotted a larger metal door with a small window at eye level. The glass was too dusty to see through, but I could make out a faint glow coming from inside. Swallowing hard, I took out the keycard again and swiped it through the lock. The metal door creaked open reluctantly. I stood frozen in the doorway, peering into a cavernous chamber barely lit by a few dingy hanging bulbs. The stench hit my nose first earthy and foul, like a neglected zoo. As my eyes adjusted, I gasped at what lay before me. As my eyes adjusted to the dim lighting, I gasped at the sight before me. The large room was filled with rows of cages, each containing a creature. They were humanoid in form, but horribly deformed, twisted and malformed in nightmarish ways. Some had extra limbs, Others were missing arms or legs. One creature had eyes covering its body like a peacock's feathers. Another had no eyes at all, only smooth skin where its face should be. The creatures writhed and moaned, crammed together in their small cages. The room reeked of filth and bodily odors. When the creatures caught sight of me, they fell eerily silent, dozens of eyes staring in my direction. I stood paralyzed as the creatures scrutinized me with looks of desperation, agony, and even hope. My scientific curiosity overpowered the horror I felt. I never could have imagined such radically altered human beings. Who could have engineered such perverse experiments? And why? Were these poor souls volunteers? Or victims? I crept closer to examine the nearest cage. The creature inside looked vaguely female, with six underdeveloped arms of differing lengths. She shied away and made whimpering noises as I approached. It's all right, I said softly. I'm a doctor. I want to help you. I reached to open her cage so I could better inspect her deformities. Suddenly, a booming voice echoed through the room. Step away from the subject, it bellowed. I jumped back, looking around wildly to identify the source. The voice continued reverberating from unseen speakers. This area is strictly off-limits. You are trespassing on classified property and interfering with sensitive medical research. Be advised that security measures have been activated. My heart dropped into my stomach. I had clearly stumbled onto something I was never meant to see. I needed to get out immediately before I ended up locked in one of these cages myself. 
I turned to run, but paused at the heartbreaking scene before me. The creatures stared desperately at me through the bars of their cages, bony hands grasping at the air between us. I was likely their only chance of rescue from this grim fate, but I was totally powerless against whatever shadowy forces were holding them here. I'm sorry, I whispered sadly. One creature, taller than the rest, stepped forward and pressed its elongated face between the bars, fixing me with an intense stare. Its sunken eyes bored into mine, conveying a strangely human-like intelligence and understanding. It studied me a moment, then opened its mouth and uttered a single, pleading word in a raspy voice. Help! I froze, stunned that the creatures were capable of speech. Before I could react, the voice returned, harsh and booming through the room. Last warning. Exit the premises immediately or security will take lethal action. There was no more time. With a final anguished look back at the tragic creatures, I turned and raced from the room just as alarms began blaring deafeningly. I sprinted back through the maze of corridors, hearing heavy footfalls close behind. When I reached the exit, I crashed through it and kept running all the way back to my room, not stopping until I had barricaded the door behind me. My heart pounded as I rushed out of the east wing, slamming the door behind me. I had seen too much, things no one was meant to witness. All I could do now was try to pretend nothing had happened. I walked as calmly as I could manage back to my room in the staff dormitory. Only once my door was securely locked did I allow myself to break down. I slumped to the floor, chest heaving, clutching the stolen keycard until it cut into my palm. Those desperate eyes still haunted me, pleading voices echoing in my mind. I now understood the horrible secret this place had hidden away. The question was, could I live with being complicit in such evil? I had no doubt that voice was serious about lethal force. But how long could I stay silent? The next morning I went about my usual hospital duties with an anxious knot in my stomach. I tried to act normal, but my mind kept flashing back to the horrors I had witnessed in the Forbidden Ward. I changed IV bags and took vitals with shaky hands, hoping my unease wasn't obvious to my patients. As I was reviewing medication orders, Nurse Kaplan approached me. You're looking a little pale today, doctor. Everything all right? She asked. I forced a smile. Oh, I'm fine. Just didn't sleep very well last night. She gave me a sideways glance. If you say so. But take care of yourself, okay? We need you at your best around here. I nodded, afraid if I spoke further I might accidentally let something slip. I couldn't let any hint about the creatures cross my lips. The truth had to stay buried for now. I busied myself with my rounds, examining patients and charting their statuses. But my mind kept wandering back to the locked ward and its tortured inhabitants. I wondered if any of my co-workers knew what was going on there. Did Dr. Heidel have others helping with his deranged experiments? Were certain nurses tasked with caring for the poor creatures? As I checked Mr. Garrison's breathing, I found myself scrutinizing the face of each staff member I encountered. Searching for any sign of deception, any hint they were privy to the hospital's awful secrets. But I found nothing besides typical pleasant chit-chat and discussion of patient cases. Either they were oblivious or expert actors. I realized I could trust no one. That night I awoke from a fitful sleep to the sound of faint cries once again echoing through the halls. My heart ached, knowing the creatures were still suffering despite the risks I had taken to help them. I tossed and turned for hours, wishing there was more I could do to end their plight. But the situation seemed hopeless. Over the next couple of weeks, I struggled to concentrate on even simple tasks. My thoughts were consumed with concern for the creatures. I nearly gave Mrs. Clark a double dose of medication before Nurse Kaplan caught my mistake. What's gotten into you lately? She asked with a worried look. That's not like you at all. I stammered an apology, saying I hadn't been sleeping well. But inside my mind was screaming. 
How could I go on pretending nothing was wrong when such horrors lurked right under our noses? I had to find some way to intervene, but had no idea where to even begin. One evening, Dr. Heidel called me into his office. I've noticed you seem very preoccupied these days, he said, irritable and distracted. Are you sure nothing is bothering you? Though his tone was kind, I detected a hint of suspicion in his eyes. I assured him I was fine, just feeling stressed and tired. He studied me for a few uncomfortable moments before suggesting I take a leave of absence to recover. Panicked at the thought of being away from the hospital, I declined. Inside I cringed, knowing I was now on his radar. I would need to be more careful going forward. On my nights off I started wandering the grounds, searching for any clues about the hospital's true operations. Most areas were securely locked down, but one evening as I walked past the medical records wing, I noticed one of the doors had been left slightly ajar. My heart began racing as I realized this could be my chance to uncover the information they were trying to hide. I quickly slipped inside the dark records room, closing the door softly behind me. The space was filled with rows of tall metal filing cabinets, and the air smelled of dust and aging paper. I clicked on my small pen light, its dim glow barely enough to navigate by. But I didn't dare turn on the overhead lights and risk attracting attention. This clandestine operation had to be quick and quiet. I began skimming through the filing cabinets closest to me, but they seemed to contain only mundane logistical paperwork, budgets, supply orders, and maintenance requests. Nothing hinting at the true nature of this facility. I worked methodically through each drawer, growing anxious that I may not find anything useful. Nearly ready to give up, I moved to the very back corner of the records room. There, cramped into the small space, were three large cardboard document boxes, coated in a layer of dust. They were unmarked except for a label on each reading, restricted access, authorized personnel only. My hands trembled slightly as I opened the first box flap, knowing this could be it. Finally, the answers I had risked so much to find. The box was full of medical charts and lab reports, but all potentially sensitive details had been meticulously redacted with thick black marker. I skimmed through page after page, searching for any visible words that might offer clues. Between the heavy redactions, I could make out scattered references to experimental procedure, genetic mutation, adverse reaction, and fatality. My blood ran cold. Were they documenting the creation of the deformed creatures I had seen? The next folder contained clinical notes on monitoring different specimens following various induced mutations. There were charts showing heart rate, breathing rate, and neural activity readings, all classified into specimen numbers rather than names. So they were intentionally creating these poor beings and treating them more like lab animals than people. What kind of place was this? Further down, I uncovered several autopsy reports with photos that turned my stomach. The mangled bodies showed the extent of damage from their perverse attempts to rewrite the human genome. Eyes, limbs, organs, all formed incorrectly while still trying to function. The agony these victims must have endured. Digging deeper, I found research updates referencing goals to engineer enhanced sensory perception, as well as optimized physical traits for strength, speed, and resilience. They were trying to build some twisted superhuman through barbaric means. My heart broke for the innocent lives destroyed by this mad experiment. I could not fathom such cruel disregard for human dignity, all in the name of scientific progress. The next document froze my blood. It was a memo advising on proper cadaver disposal procedures following terminal specimen harvesting. There were photographs of rail-thin humanoid corpses being loaded into an industrial incinerator. So this was where failed subjects ended up, burned and disposed of as clinical waste. I shuddered, imagining how many had died already, nameless victims treated as less than human even in death. Sifting through the confidential information, I finally grasped the true horror and scale of this clandestine program. They were engineering mutated human beings through horrific means, 
killing and disposing of subjects deemed unviable. Back in the isolation of my small dorm room, I agonized over what my next move should be. I had taken an enormous risk by sneaking into the forbidden East Wing earlier. The mysterious captive creatures I briefly witnessed were seared into my memory. Their anguished cries echoed in my ears. But while my curiosity was satisfied, I still lacked any real understanding of who they were and why they were confined there. I paced my sparse quarters into the late hours, debating with myself. Further snooping would undoubtedly put me in grave danger if I was caught. Dr. Heidel and his associates did not seem like men to take lightly. But how could I go on with my comfortable routine, knowing such anguish was occurring just floors below? I would be complicit through my inaction. As the night stretched on, the right choice became clear, even if it put my life at risk. I had to try getting back into that ward to learn more about those poor creatures. Seeing them up close again may help me understand who they were and how they ended up in such misery. It was a thin hope, but my only option if I held any desire to comprehend their plight. I would likely get only one more chance before security tightened. I had to try soon. Over the next week, I discreetly observed the security patterns, noting the guards' rounds and shift changes. My best opportunity seemed to be between 11 p.m. and midnight, when most staff were home. The guards paced the East Wing Hall every 30 minutes, leaving a short gap when their backs were turned. Enough time to slip in quietly, if I moved swiftly. The night I selected came all too quickly. My anxiousness mounted through the day as I envisioned the many ways I could be captured or killed if caught. I understood fully the grave personal risks I was taking. But a voice inside compelled me forward. If I turned away now, I may never understand the truth of those creatures' existence. When the fateful hour finally came, I put on dark clothes and my most soundless shoes in case I needed to run for my life. I waited until midnight exactly, then slipped from my room and crept along the edges of the grounds to avoid detection. Approaching the east wing side door, I steadied my nerves and pulled out the stolen keycard, damp with my sweat. Holding my breath, I slowly cracked open the door just wide enough to squeeze through. The creature's muffled cries echoed from within the concrete walls, both chilling and beckoning. Here I go again, I thought. Saying one last prayer for courage, I stepped into the darkness. I had to see them once more, to understand. I crept slowly, ducking into alcoves whenever I heard approaching footsteps other than my own hushed steps. But the halls remained empty and still. At last, I reached the final security door concealing the ward itself. I cautiously swiped the stolen card and tensed as the lock mechanism whirred. The heavy door creaked open. Slipping inside quickly before detection, I closed it with the softest click, just as footsteps echoed down the hall. So close this time. But I had made it. My eyes slowly adjusted to the darkness as the creatures came into view once more. My flashlight beam cut through the darkness, illuminating the cramped cages and their disfigured inhabitants. The creatures shrunk back, shielding their large, luminous eyes from the harsh light and whimpering piteously. It's all right, I whispered gently. I'm not going to hurt you. The creatures gradually lowered their arms from their faces, their distended eyes following me warily as I moved slowly among the rows of cages, taking in the horrific sight. Many of the beings were utterly inhuman in form, their bodies warped and mutated in disturbing ways by unchecked genetic experimentation. Yet in their gazes, I saw profound suffering and intelligence, hints of the souls still dwelling within these misshapen shells. I paused by a cage on the end, holding a slight feminine creature with delicate features. Her arms and legs were unnaturally long and skinny, with an extra joint in the middle. She drew herself up into a corner of the cage, regarding me carefully as I approached. I spoke in soft, soothing tones, assuring her she had nothing to fear from me. I was not there to harm her, only to understand. But she remained wary, 
her elongated body huddled tightly in on itself, eyes tracking my every movement. I slowly sat cross-legged on the cold floor beside her cage, so our eyes were level. In a gentle voice, I told her I wished only to help end the suffering of her and her kindred somehow. But first, I needed to comprehend who they were and how they came to be in such anguish. As I spoke, her piercing emerald eyes softened almost imperceptibly. She crept forward with cautious grace, studying my face intently through the metal bars. Emboldened, I extended my hand slowly, palm up, toward her cage. She hesitated, then stretched out one of her slender, seven-fingered hands. Her smooth black claws glinted in the dim light. Our palms touched, her soft white skin against my own. Simple as it was, the gesture felt profound. In this moment, two worlds met with empathy and trust. I knew then I would do everything in my power to free these beings from their torment. But first, I needed to understand their origins. If I could secretly gather physiological data from them, it may reveal clues about how they were created in this place, altered against nature's will. I hesitated to exploit them further, but saw no other way to unravel the medical mysteries that had warped their forms. After a thoughtful pause, I withdrew my hand and retrieved a small medical kit I had smuggled in. Through gestures and calming words, I tried to convey my wish to take a blood sample from her. Perhaps I could analyze it to find anomalies in her genetics. At the sight of the needle, her luminous eyes widened and she shrunk back in fear. It's all right, I soothed. After much coaxing, she finally extended her slender arm tentatively through the bars. With delicate care, I slid the needle under her pale skin, drawing a small vial of copper-hued blood. Thank you, I whispered gratefully. Just then, the sound of approaching voices reached my ears, security guards making their nightly rounds. My heart froze for an instant before adrenaline flooded my system. I swiftly stowed the precious blood sample in my med kit and darted into an empty cell, pulling the rusty door closed just as the outer door opened and footsteps entered the ward. I huddled motionless in the corner, barely breathing, praying my illegal presence would go unnoticed. The shadows concealed me from the narrow barred window in the cell door as two guards strolled casually down the aisle, sweeping their flashlights side to side. I craned my neck to peer through a tiny crack between the door and frame. The creatures recoiled and cowered from the harsh beams passing over them. The guards paused to casually harass some of the more disfigured beings, rattling their cages and laughing derisively at their distress. One creature with elongated limbs like the female I had drawn blood from huddled at the back of its cage as far from the light as possible. Ha ha, get a look at this freak! One guard sneered. I've seen roadkill prettier than that thing. The other one chuckled cruelly at his companion's mocking. I don't know why the eggheads bother keeping these rejects alive, he remarked. They should just cut their losses and start fresh. They shone their lights sadistically around the ward a few more moments before continuing their rounds, voices fading into the distance. My pulse pounded in my ears as I cautiously slipped out of my hiding place. I felt disgusted and enraged at the guard's casual cruelty toward helpless, suffering beings. It hardened my resolve to unravel the secrets of this place and bring its abuses to light. But for now, getting caught would only make that harder. Keeping to the shadows, I swiftly but silently retraced my steps back to the exit. Nearing the final door, I froze as voices approached from the other side. Thought I heard something. Might as well check it again keys jangled and the handle began to turn. Acting on pure instinct, I darted behind a protruding section of wall, flattening myself against it as the door creaked open. Two more guards entered, sweeping flashlights around the dim space. Hmm. Guess it was nothing, one muttered as they peered cursorily around before returning the way they came. My lungs burning, I crept from my hiding spot. That had been far too close. Taking a moment to still my shaking limbs, I slipped out into the hall and moved as quickly as I could. 
Back in my dorm, I anxiously prepared microscope slides with the blood sample, my hands trembling with nervous excitement. If this creature's DNA contained anomalies as I suspected, it could finally confirm my worst fears about this hospital's purpose. I had smuggled in a basic microscope and other lab equipment weeks prior in anticipation of this moment. Now I sat staring through the lens as I systematically scanned the sample, searching intently for any indication of genetic tampering. The cells appeared relatively normal at first glance, but concentrating on the nuclei revealed stunning abnormalities. Foreign DNA segments had clearly been spliced directly into the original double helix genome, introducing entirely new genes. The new genes were interwoven with the host DNA, creating novel proteins tailored to produce drastic physiological changes. This level of targeted genetic manipulation was absolutely state-of-the-art. Whatever was happening here was highly advanced and highly unethical. This conclusively proved the creatures were not mere freaks of nature, but the intentional products of meticulous bioengineering. In the days that followed, I became obsessed with the creatures. When not at work, I paced my cramped quarters, agonizing over what I had witnessed and what my next move should be. I now grasped the full, horrific extent of the unethical genetic experiments being conducted here. Those poor beings were clearly suffering immensely, both physically and mentally. Yet exposing the truth publicly would likely be professional suicide, or worse. Dr. Heidel and his powerful conspirators had too much influence, and few reasons to let a disposable newcomer like me threaten their ambitions. I debated anonymously reporting the inhumane research, but such accusations against prestigious doctors would require solid evidence I still lacked. No authorities would investigate only my word, and if they traced the report back to me, I could kiss my career goodbye, or potentially my freedom, or life. The risks were monumental. In weak moments I even contemplated plans for liberating the creatures myself. But the compound was too secure. Perhaps with months of planning, I could engineer a prison break of some kind, but we likely wouldn't make it ten feet before the guards gunned us down. No, risky heroics would only add me to the body count and aid no one. As each day passed, the truth sank in further that I was utterly powerless in this situation. I had taken foolish risks already that could still cost me everything if I was exposed. My moral outrage meant nothing in the face of such ruthless pragmatism. For now, the creatures would remain imprisoned subjects, beyond any hope. I did my best to cope with the disturbing secret and the deep helplessness that accompanied it. I avoided wandering near the East Wing, lest I give in to another bout of useless defiance. At night, the creatures' anguished cries haunted my restless dreams, jolting me awake in a cold sweat. I would lay staring at the ceiling for hours, this oppressive knowledge carving a hollow space inside me. During work, I went through the motions in a fog, struggling to avoid drawn looks from Dr. Heidel. The creatures were never far from my thoughts. I felt tortured by the sickening experiments occurring just out of sight and by my own powerlessness to intervene. In weaker moments, I felt crushing regret that I had ever stumbled upon this. I almost wished I could forget it all entirely, wash it from my memory and consciousness. I attempted to bury myself in my work, avoiding reflective silences by filling my time with patience and clerical tasks. If any associates noticed my newfound studious intensity, they made no mention. But inside, my thoughts churned endlessly, returning over and over to the damned ward and the secrets festering behind its walls. Looking back now, decades later, I'm still haunted by those anguished eyes watching me from within their cramped cages. Though the intervening years have faded some details, the creatures remain vivid in both memory and nightmare. After leaving St. Agnes Hospital, I struggled for some time with the awful secrets I still carried. I debated exposing the truth publicly, but feared retaliation from the powerful figures behind the experiments. In the end, I said nothing, 
trying vainly to leave that dark chapter behind me. But while I moved on in body, part of me remains trapped in those concrete halls, tormented by helplessness and regret. Not a day goes by that I don't wonder what became of them, those poor beings who trusted me in a fleeting moment of contact. Are they still caged somewhere, or did the research shut down? I'll likely never know. Of course, I realize I was young and lacked power or status. The risk of becoming a blacklisted whistleblower was very real in those days. But rationalizations don't silence the echoes of their captivity that still stalk my restless mind. Even if speaking out had only destroyed me, might I have better served them, and my own conscience, by trying? These doubts gnaw at me constantly. I think of all they suffered under the scalpels and microscopes, reduced to nameless lab specimens. Did their existence ever amount to more than that? Or are they long dead and discarded, denied even the dignity of memory? It pains me to ponder such questions. I still lay awake some nights, hearing their cries, feeling their skeletal hands grasping from behind bars. Those wordless pleas haunt me, and I'm left to wrestle with my own weakness and cowardice in not fighting for their release. At times I've been tempted to return to St. Agnes to see what became of the East Wing and its inmates, but I know only ghosts reside there now, ghosts I stirred from their uneasy sleep so long ago. The doctors and their specimens are all gone, dust in the ground or wind, no earthly closure remains possible. All I can do now is carry this burden of truth and regret that links me still to those whose agony I briefly shared. I've learned to live with the hollowness carved out within me during those strange days. It is my penance for failing to give voice to the voiceless. Some doors, once opened, can never be closed again.